morning, Kings Park. What a privilege to serve you this morning by preaching of the word. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Chapter 6, 19 to 20. If you, uh, your legs would permit, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in reverence to God's word. We're just going to read two verses. Allow me to read the first verse from the NIV, 1984. I'd like to invite you to read the last two verses with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Let's all read the last two sentences together. Ready? From the screen, go. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This is the word of the Lord. Father, open our hearts to know you. Open this word that we might live by it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you. Margaret Wolf Hungerford in her 1878 novel, entitled Molly Bond, writes a famous phrase that goes like this, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Have you heard that phrase before? All right. Shakespeare said something similar. It says, beauty is bought by judgment of the eye. You know, we are a people who we see something physically attractive. You know, we have something to say, maybe in our minds, and some of us, maybe we articulate that. How do you compliment or praise someone's beauty? I have a few suggestions here. You know, for the women, how, how will you respond when a man would, would say this to you? Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Oh, yeah. An attractive man comes up to a woman and says, your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. How would you feel if a man tells you, your breasts like clusters of fruit, I said, I will climb the palm tree, I will take hold of its fruit. Probably a different context, yeah. Um, what, if a, what if a woman tells, tells a man, uh, your eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels? How would you feel, men, if a woman comes up to you and says, your lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh? How about this one? Your arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. Wow. That woman would probably say, I'm going to be rich, you know, <laughs> something like that. You know, we're quick to, to see what's attractive. We praise people. Some of us, we struggle, you know, in our offices, in our workplaces. We, we find something we, we don't want to be quick to compliment. We're, sometimes we're afraid, you know, we, they might misunderstand us. They might think we're flirting with them, things like that. Uh, whichever you are, we need to understand that even the world, through commercials, movies, you know, um, TVs, they, they, the world is training us to give compliments, to get something back, to elicit some, even some sexual interest maybe, or, or to gain an affection from someone. Even some of us were, were trained or raised up in a way as to get some measure of attention or affection, or maybe especially for those that are, uh, you know, still looking for somebody to be with in life. Um, they're looking for somebody to be interested in them. I used to be one of those. But can't we just be beautiful? Can't we just be in a place of being secure, significant, apart from needing or uh, needing to get something or someone? What if sex was primarily about giving than instead of getting? Um, I read for you a few lines from a Hebrew uh, collection of love poems called The Song of Songs. It's about the experience of a lover and his beloved. Uh, it wasn't about some ingredients for a dish, okay? So... This was after the fall, after humanity rebelled. It's, it describes the beauty and power of sex and sexual intimacy. It describes the joys and the pleasures that God has given us. When I was a young believer, I read this book, and I, it caught me because it mentioned three things. It's mentioned one phrase three times, and I remember it says, Do not stir or awaken love until it so desires. That put a break on a lot of the things I was doing, made me reflect. You see, this was not only a dialogue about dating, there was courtship, there were friends, you know, and there was marriage, and there was, you know, sexual intercourse, sexual intimacy. Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 12 to 5, 1, seems to be one of the highlights or the climaxes when the lover said, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, Nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. Skipping one verse, the beloved response, 
Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. Lover responds again. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb in my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Oftentimes, it's so hard to talk about sex today without getting into the bad stuff. Have you ever wondered why parents rarely talk about this topic with their children or even with their fellow, you know, married couples? We, as a church, have been pushed back with these thoughts, you know, the world will throw us. Yeah, you can talk about anything, but don't you dare talk about my body. My body is my business. It's my private choice. So we get a world that is lost in this area. You know, is there more than that, some, more than this phrase that the church can say besides sex is for the married? It's true, but not completely. How about the unmarried? The young adults, the adults that are not young but unmarried. Are they currently or temporarily sexless? There was a time we used to write biodata. There was a category that says sex. The boxes were male and female. Today, that's different. I want to tell you, beloved, that there is a place where we can celebrate sex and sexuality, where, where there's no guilt, no rejection, no shame. There is a way today for you and I to celebrate our naked bodies and its parts while still being unashamed. This is only possible if we believe the truth that you and I were bought at a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, You were not your own, you were bought at a price. Why did we need to be bought? Who or from what were we being bought from? Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. It was a time when Rome was in power. And in the Roman Empire, in ancient Rome, sexual morality was mostly about maintaining the status quo. It was maintaining, you know, the, the power and the authority, the control of, of protecting the manliness of those who had influence. The word porneia referred to prostitution, where sex was being bought and sold. It was about bodies which become commodities. There were two kinds of women, the honorable and the shameful. But those honorable were protected. Their behavior was very strictly watched, who they were with. They were not allowed to just have sex with anybody because they were bred to breed the next royalty, the next people in power. But for the shameful, there was abuse. There were slaves. They were at the expense of whoever had power and influence. Contrary to popular belief, also in ancient Rome, they did not allow sex between grown men of equal social status as well. There was slavery and there were freed men. Bodies were bought and used for whatever they wanted. In Rodney Stark's book, The Rise of Christianity, in spite of severe persecution, he documents that Christianity rose in the midst of that Roman Empire. In population, they grew. Many people were attracted to Christians. Why? One of the reasons why is because they saw how the men in Christianity and the women in Christianity treated one another. They were treated with purity. They, the women were treated with honor. They weren't just, you know, articles to possess. The, the women also respected the men and, and found their, each of their places and their roles together. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, Paul echoes this and he says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. And this was going to echo in their minds. Slaves, yeah, we're not slaves. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? This pericope, this passage, is in the middle of the, the context of, of, of instructions about sexual morality. Paul says, flee immorality. And, and, and it says that it starts with this verse, with the phrase, the body. You see, sex matters to God because bodies matter to God. Can we actually talk about sex without talking the body? What is that? You know, the body without, you know, sex. What is that? That doesn't exist. 
how we view sex will de be determined by how we view our bodies. There was an ancient teaching that was leading people astray, and it crept into the church. It's called Gnosticism. And part of the things that they were teaching was that, you know, your spirit is good, but the body, the flesh, all that's bad. Now, the world and, its fl and the flesh, there, there, there's a fallen nature, yes, but the body is not innately bad. But sometimes, somehow we still carry that, you know. We struggle in our bodies. We have sexual urges, and we, we think that it's a curse from God. Why do I have this sexual drive, you know? I just need to, to get into sex. Well, was it like that in the origin? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, listen to this, male and female, he created them. The word male is the word zakar. It means sharp, pointed, meant to pierce. The word female is, is the word nekeva, and it means a hole, a perforation, meant to be born into. And if you were the audience of Moses writing this, you know, they didn't have biology classes, they didn't have genetics, they didn't have to look for, you know, is this male, is this female? It was kind of obvious, even for Pharaoh, if they were boys, kill them. The girls, you let them live. That is a man. That is a woman. It was very clear. Come on, God made it clear for us. Give him praise. You see, in its immediate context, we says, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Right, immediately after he says, male and female, he says, be fruitful. The capacity to bear fruit, to create another human being was between male and female. Male and male, don't do it. Female and female, don't do it. It was in the beginning, before sin, before the fall, before all this confusion, it was clear. He says, multiply. God called it. You can jump to jump verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1. You see, in the first five days, God saw what he created. And he says, it's good. But at the end, he says, in, at the end of six days, he says, it is very good. Your bodies are made very good. We being made an image and likeness of God is very good. Beloved, we can either subscribe to Scripture or subscribe to gender theory, which, by the way, still remains a theory created in these 1900s. And we have a choice today. Which one will order our lives? You see, men had bodies. Women were more delicate. God shifted into refining because women were made from something that was already created Men were made from the dust. Women were created from something that was alive. And that's why they're more delicate. They need more refined stuff. Men do not gestate. Men do not incubate. They do not lactate. Women do. But for the men, it, does, it just means they can do more stuff. Uh, we can't. And we need to accept that. Dr. Yarhouse one of our lecturers in, in, in Regent University, clinical psychologist, he says, he holds that sex is something we are, not just something we do. It's part of our identity. It wasn't, when, when you were married, you know, you didn't lose your sex. You're still male and female. When you're unmarried, you, you didn't lose your sex. You still are male and female. You and I need to come to a place of celebrating maleness and femaleness. He also says that the act of sexual intercourse, though, is clearly made exclusive for husband and wife. As it says in Hebrews 13, 4, do not let the marriage bed be defiled. But the purpose of this, eventually we'll see this in Genesis chapter 2, that, the, that God had meant it to be in the context of marriage. The one flesh union, for those of you who are aspiring to get married, understand that the wedding is a worship event because we need, to God, we need God to work His power to unite two different lives. The one flesh union could not be performed by a priest or a pastor. It only can be performed by the Holy Spirit. Contracts can be signed anytime, but the one flesh union in the eyes of many witnesses is precious, is sacred. And sexual intercourse is meant for our enjoyment as we have read in the Song of Songs. We should not be ashamed to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. Augustine said that. Augustine said that. I didn't say that. I need to say, our bodies go through stages of sexual development 
from birth to death, and it should be good for us to understand it and talk about it. I implore you, if you're a parent, if you're an elder brother or a sister, if nobody's talking to your younger siblings, to the children, we need to talk to them. Nugget size it. Teach them at their age what they can understand, what they need to understand. And it's because this church and those who have the pillar, we, the church, are the pillar of truth. We, we have become silent. We've let internet and media be the spokesperson about sex. But God is the author of sex. We have more truth in us. And we should teach it. You see, sex was made by God with bodies that are pure. And it, were made, they were, it was made for glorious purposes. My own personal journey as a teenager, when I got saved, before I got saved, I, we were the kinds of guys who were experts in isolation play. Have you ever heard of isolation play? Not just in basketball. We were good in high school. We were good at taking out men around a woman so that our guy would be able to talk to the girl and get on a date. We were the experts. We were like Mission Impossible. We were then, 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 then. We could get people on a date and, and, and just connect them and, and make sure that they have a good time. Of course, what happens after would be, you know, we're going to feast on that. We're going to talk about it. But then that was me before I got saved. We ourselves were like quick to be attracted, quick to take. But when it came to getting serious about commitment, eh, eh. So we ended up breaking many hearts, not thinking that we were also draining our own emotions for the one true person we were eventually going to marry. But I, I realized that when I got saved, I realized that I was just seeking for companionship, for something exciting. I was seeking, you know, this sexual interaction, this dating, and hopefully somebody would just marry me. You know, it became about finding the right one. I realized, you know, oh, me and my friends were like using one name, you know. They introduce, we introduce ourselves, hi, my name is Will. Yeah? Yeah, God's Will. <laughs> and so we, we kind of lived that way for a while. But I kid you not, as I grew in the Lord, that was past life. As I grew in the Lord, God taught me, why you keep, why you keep looking for, for somebody? Is my love not enough for you? And God told me, what if, what if, if my love is not enough for you, you think any woman's would be enough for you? And, and so all this girl watching and, and boy watching was like, man, it became clear to me. Yeah, what, what in the world? I was engaging to get something instead to give. And my prayer turned from, Lord, let, let me find the right one to my prayer to became, Lord, teach me to be the right one so that at the right time I can give myself. Uh, a teenager asked me recently, he said, well, how will you know if we're sexually compatible, you know, if we don't have sex? And so it was a well-meaning question. He didn't know. Nobody was teaching him. He's a new believer. And I said, well, what is your baseline for sexual compatibility? Like, what is your reference? How, how will you know if you're, you know? The question in itself, I said, has a problem. Now, think about this. You have sex with somebody. You're not married to her, or you're just maybe just dating, and then you gauge yourself, what? You give yourself a score based on your experience, and then you find somebody more attractive, and then you try that too. What is this, food tasting? <laughs> I said, now think about this. I, 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 st I started shifting, listen, do you want to get married? Yes. Well, think about, you have to have a vision being with somebody naked and unashamed someday. Do you want that the person that you're going to be marrying has given herself to multiple partners in this lifestyle that you're talking about? I said, no. Same with you. I and those with me, you know, realized an empty way of life. And this is what we need to be redeemed from. At least in this area of sex and romance and dating. We had a life group and we asked this question. In what way should we talk about this? Sex, dating, romance, and marriage. Is it? And, and people said, let's talk about dating, let's talk about courtship, and then let's talk about marriage, and then let's talk about sex. No, nope, let's talk about sex first. Because what your view of sex is will determine the kind of marriage that you view. Let's talk about marriage, and then your view of marriage will determine the kind of courtship you will have, and the boundaries you will set. And the kind of courtship you will have will determine the boundaries you will set in your dating life. What is our view of sex? What is your view of her body? 
God said in 1 Peter chapter 1, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from the forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Beloved, I submit to you, you and I were bought with the blood of Jesus. The precious blood of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 says, In Christ, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with riches of God's grace. He's lavished this on us with all wisdom and understanding. If you have come to this point in your life and you think that you're less than those that you think are more pretty or more handsome than you, they got all these kinds of six-pack, eight-pack, 12-pack like Batman, I don't know. You know, if you think you're less and, and less worthy of, of attraction, or maybe you've had some bad experiences and made you feel like you were trash and you feel like you're damaged because I want to tell you, your life and mine have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next time we, we question how precious we are, those of us who are having some, some thoughts of taking our life because we've had these all bad things and all this junk and all these memories, listen to me. You are precious to God. You have a great purpose from God. Don't take your life. Don't destroy your body. Don't get into drugs. Don't give yourself to any kind of relationship that is not from God. Our body means a lot to the Lord. God has such a high view of the body that God himself, when he was saving us, came in a body. He didn't come by spirit, by angel, by air or by fire and all kinds of elements in nature. He came with the body, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was born of a woman and was raised as a man. He, he understood what he had made because he's the author of it. And he, and he bought our lives with another body that had no sin. With that body, Christ carried that cross. With that body, you want to be a man? Are you ready to die to yourself? The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I, ask, I always tell the guys, uh, you know, help me, you know, prepare for courtship. Well, are you ready to die to yourself? Because the love that we're, gonna, we're taught to give is sacrificial. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up. Of course, there's also a version of this for the women. It's very clear, men. Are you ready to die to yourself? Christ carried the cross, we can't. But we need to put to death an old nature. If you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a Bible-believing, you know, follower of Christ, a disciple, we need to understand you and I are bought with the blood of Jesus, not just our hearts, not just our souls, but our bodies as well. Revelation 5, 9 says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It wasn't just this culture or that culture. You, we come in different shapes and sizes. And we need to see the beauty of God, the beauty of the image of God in every single one of us. And we need to learn to complement that in every person that we meet because God has made us beautiful. You are handsome, you men, women, with or without makeup, there's beauty in you. If your fathers have not said this to you, I'm so sorry. If your brothers have laughed at you, if your friends have not appreciated your beauty, how good you look, understand that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and our beholder is our Father in heaven. We were purchased by the very life of our Lord and Maker, and He died with that same blood being shed, and then He rose from the dead, because with that rising from the dead, the Holy Spirit gave, gave life and, to His mortal body, and you and I can experience that as Christians. Our bodies today are being given life by the power of the Holy Spirit. We were bought with the blood of Jesus. By His blood, we have been justified. That means our sins, according to the law, have been pardoned. We have peace with God by His blood. There is reconciliation. 
There's no more rejection. We are no longer enemies. We don't need to be anxious about the next person who's going to reject us. Beloved, I appeal to you. There is a love that is beholding you and I. In the midst of the ugliness of things we have experienced, maybe not your sin, but maybe sins of others against you, there is a love that will not change. Because our beholder is not just our father, our beholder is also the lover of our lives. He really, really loves us. We have forgiveness by His blood, a purification from sins. And if I'm saying things that are triggering you, please hold on until the end. Because I, I really felt like God wants you to see how painful these are, but also how powerful God can heal us and turn things around. There's no longer uncleanness, impurities, and we're not perfect, sure, and we tend to just, you know, stain ourselves again. But understand this, the mercy of God is available to us. The grace of God is available to us every single day. We can be victorious by the power of the blood. We have spiritual enemies too besides the world system in our, in our old nature. We have spiritual enemies that's trying to rack this up, you know, just, just ramp it up again, you know, all these sexual sins and and, and, and God has, has said in his, his word, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The blood of Jesus cleansing us should translate to us speaking about, yes, I used to be this, but God cleansed my life. I, among many, are, am not qualified to preach the gospel to you. But by the grace of God, I'm here standing to testify that we can live victorious over sexual sins. We can. It's not easy. It can be a process. It can be a long time. For some, it's instant. But for many, it's a process of walking alongside with the people who call on God with a pure heart. Our bodies are now two things. A temple of the Holy Spirit and now belong to God. Let me break that down. These are the two implications of being bought with the blood, bought with the, bought with the price of Christ's blood. First, the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? In their context, when you wanted to do business in a region, you had to worship a certain God in a specific temple. Otherwise, they won't let you. The God in that region or you know, multiple gods. And that temple was the, the, the power in that place. So the Romans had power, you know, but also the Greeks, you know, were, the Greek practice were embraced by the Romans, so they had their own versions of the gods of the Greeks. And you can only avail the power of that God if you were in that temple and worshiping him. But for you and I, we don't need to worship in their temple because our bodies become the temple of God. Christians were really persecuted this way because they would not worship in any temple. And the revelation of, of our bodies being the temple of God is so powerful that we become sacred spaces. We become the very place where God himself dwells. No other religion would claim that. They would say God is with them, but not God is in them. Temples were supposed to be set apart. Temples were very stepping places of God. And so we are, because we are the temple of God, in these bodies we can avail the power of God. We can avail the graces of God, the, the mercies of God. We can have the power to live a holy life. We can live victorious over pornography and masturbation. And people will say, oh, you know, pornography and masturbation, they're, they're, they're fine among the sexual sins because I'm not really hurting anyone. But have you ever, have you ever considered that God is hurt? Do you use pornography without your eyes? Are not your eyes part of the body? When you masturbate, is it just an emotional masturbation? No, it's a physical one. But our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Please don't get quiet on me now. You see, all sin hurts God. And at the core of pornography and masturbation is self-gratification. And again, do you think that God would give us bodies that, we would, that he would curse us with his sexual drive? Did they fail to teach in biology that also our bodies have a way of stabilizing itself when the sexual urges were, were 
pushing us to, to behave in a certain way, it has a way to relieve itself without having to engage in sexual sin. What? Yeah, but it wasn't in my book. Yeah, I'm telling you now. God is smarter than our biology. He knows what we need. He knows we need to eat and sleep and have urges. But he is also the one who's going to satisfy our desires. You see, many people engage in, engage in sexual sin because they're looking for illegitimate things, in, uh, for legitimate things in an illegitimate way. Would you let God be God in your body, in our life? Hold on to the word. When you're tempted to masturbate, to get in porn, instead of holding that gadget, instead of holding that thing, hold the cell phone, call your friend. Hold that Bible, read the word. But when there's a, another person of the opposite sex that's tempting you, don't just pray in tongues. Don't just hold a Bible or a cross, you know, think like they're vampire. Get out of there! Just go out. The power of the feet. Beloved, when we engage in sexual activity, our bodies are wired to throw in dopamine and oxytocin into our bloodstream. Some of you have not heard that. Oxytocin, you know, is a bonding hormone. It's a chemical. And your senses are heightened. Your eyes, your sense of smell and, and taste in your ears. It's, it's supposed to create images and imprints into your brain that this person that you're with is special. Women who breastfeed their children have a deeper connection with these children because they also experience oxytocin doses when they're breastfeeding. It was meant for that. However, when we abuse this in pornography, we can't bond with anybody because it's just a picture or multiple pictures. It just gets stuck in our brain, but we're not really bonding with anything. And we use up these chemicals in our bodies, and we're not seeing our bodies being damaged. You see, through our bodies, because it's a temple, we're able to directly hear and see God and feel God's presence. There's so much in this life to sense. When I got saved and I started hearing God's voice, let me tell you, there's nothing like hearing God. It pushed my fire into a level that I re didn't realize Wow, Lord, I can actually see visions that encourages people. I can see, I can see, I can have dreams, and you're talking to me, and I can hear. You know, if you don't know what it means to hear God's voice, you know, get into discipleship, get into a life group, you know, you get into the, the spiritual gifts class. There's so much about following God that we need to explore. There's so much more to being a Christian. You think that healing bodies, laying hands is just for the super apostles? It's through your bodies that lives are meant to be healed. When you lay your hands on the sick, they will recover. And when sometimes you wonder, oh, no, those signs and wonders, they're all just in the old, you, you died with the last apostle. Really? Has the Holy Spirit ceased from moving today? Really? Who said that? Today, so many people need a touch from God. It's through our bodies that we engage in conversation, look them in the eye and tell them you are precious to God. You don't need to be prophetic to be that. God wants to redeem. God wants us to win the battle of purity, which is won through a battle of passion for God. Don't try to make, put rules in yourself. If all your baseline is just following rules, beloved, we're meant, it's just hard. But if you ask God to put fire in you for him, that battle for purity is already won. Our bodies now belong to God, number two. You are not your own, verse 20. You were bought at a price. Either we belong to God or we do not. If we accept the truth that we were bought with the blood of Jesus, we become part of his family. So many Christians still feel like they're orphans. They're still trying to win their acceptance. They're still trying to gain approval. But beloved, we need to rest. It speaks of identity. You and I are sons and daughters of God. We are that first before we identify ourselves as husbands and wives. In this relationship with other men and women, God wants to pour out His love on us so that we can bend it to our spouse 
or to our friends. God's power and love is flowing through us like a stream. There is a place of being secure. And imagine this, if you still fear rejection, understand this. If the one person who matters the most in the universe has accepted you, what rejection in this world would damage you? God wants you. He didn't just, you know, think about you and, oh, you know, there's another kid, you know. No. Sometimes they wonder, some people wonder, I wish I was not born because of the things that I've experienced. Have we ever thought about, well, God chose to have had you instead of not? So many lives are being stopped today. But I want for you and I, hearing the word of life, we can be vessels of love and acceptance. God will protect his own. He's a responsible person. Will not let your body grow hungry. He will, he will provide for us. He will protect us. He will destroy those who will destroy this body of his. Whatever belongs to God, whoever belongs to God, is should be, to be taken care of. In freedom class, we say this. You want to know who you are? You need to know whose you are. Our bodies belong to God. God is in the business of redeeming you and I and sanctifying a people in their sexual ethics through His Word and by His Spirit. And all this belonging is an exclusive belonging. Just as the Song of Songs says, My lover is mine, chapter 2, verse 16. My lover is mine, and I am his. He browses among the lilies. God wants no competition. He wants fidelity. He wants faithfulness and loyalty. You know, as husbands and wives... And even as single men and women, we belong to God. Well, how can I celebrate that singleness? Give yourself to the work of God, just as the husband and wives are. Get yourself in the community of God, the church, which is the body of Christ. There's so much more to experience. For the husband and wife, let us not use our bodies by weaponizing these sex privileges against one another when we're in a quarrel or disagreement. Let's not use our bodies for all of us to hurt someone else. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 2 to 4. My lover has gone down to his garden to the beds of spices to browse in the garden and to gather lilies. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies. We need to see God as the groom and the church as his bride. We belong to God. We have a father, a lover, a beauty beholder. Having to give ourselves Multiple times, emotionally, we give ourselves, sometimes physically, some people try to blur the boundary. Well, I'm not really having sex. I'm just, you know, well, some people say, well, when you start using zippers and buttons, that's over beyond the boundary. Where does sex begin? Is it not within the brain, in our mind, when we talk about how we like someone, love someone, do we just freely, carelessly give our feelings? What about our thoughts? And then eventually you'll hold someone's hands. And then eventually you'll give another piece of yourself, another piece and a bigger piece of yourself. And maybe you do that multiple times with a partner or maybe with multiple partners. And then we, we start realizing, wait, I'm getting thinner. Oh, um, I'm still pretty. I'm still pretty. I'm still handsome. I'm still good. And then you keep on trying that over and over and over until we realize, wait, we look ourselves in the mirror and we become something like this. Would you buy a rose like this? Would you give a rose like this? But what Christ has done through his blood, he buys this. He buys it. And he turns it into something else. And he says to us, hallelujah. He says... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That's what God does. He gives us a new heart, a new identity. He gives us a new life. Our bodies are going to be transformed, going to be changed. If you still feel that pain, you've been walking with God for quite a while. If you still have some thought patterns, just give it some time. Hang in there. 
Get into discipleship. Get that word. Get into worship. God is going to finish what he started. But we are more than a rose. We're more than a bouquet. You and I are a garden. A garden of delights. A garden that we can celebrate. Song of Songs ends with this. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as a grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. What is our mark? What is our assurance that we belong to God? The Holy Spirit. We were marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit. When we heard the word of truth, as you're hearing it today again, the gospel of our salvation, when we have come to believe in Him, and some of you are believing just now, understand that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 we are sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. We are guaranteed to experience a love stronger than death because Christ, who loved us, didn't remain dead. He rose again so that we can remember and celebrate this and know what it feels like for God to be jealous over you and I, someone who is passionate for us. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Our beholder is our father, our beholder is our lover. How can we celebrate this? The next time you take a shower and undress, you look at your body and say, God has made you very good. You look at your body from top to bottom. You look at yourself with dignity and honor. Whatever dignity you feel like you've lost, whatever honor or any measure of worth that you feel like someone sucked out of you, God is stronger. And the last word in your life will not be theirs, their action. It will be God's action. Not even your action. It will be God's action. Interestingly, the word zakar, the male, female, the male Hebrew word in Genesis chapter 1 also means to remember. So when you see the men, remember. And men, when you undress and you look at your sex organ, you have to say, I remember, Lord. I remember. I've been bought with the blood. I remember I am a man. And I need to tell others that they ought to be men and they ought to be women because that's what you made us to be. Father, I pray that you would do a new work in us. If you're here, you never knew what it means to be saved, never knew what it means to be forgiven. God is calling you. God is inviting you. And I'm going to ask everyone to pray this prayer over the breath of their mouth. And if you're here, I invite you to acknowledge sin and receive forgiveness from God. If you can believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and gave himself up for you and me so that we can be bought with his blood, this is your moment. Today is your day of salvation. Let's all pray this prayer. Say, Father, thank you for loving me through Christ who died for my sins rose again from the dead so that I can be made new so that I can be your son and your daughter change me help me live that new life I'd like to invite you to get your communion elements for Jesus had instructed his disciples to remember his body that was broken. The night he was betrayed, had dinner with his disciples, took bread, gave it to them and said, take this, eat it. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. I'd like for you to eat a piece of the bread. We are the body of Christ. Those of you who just prayed, welcome to the family of God. Would you say it in your words? Say thank you, Father. After supper, he took a cup, gave it to the disciples. He said, This from this cup is the blood that I'm about to shed. It's the blood of a covenant, it's the blood of remembrance. 
said, do this in memory of me. So this morning, when you think of the juice, the symbol of God's blood shed for us, would you say thank you? Say it in your own words. Take 10 seconds. Just remember. Say it in your own words. Don't be thrifty with words. Just thank the Lord. Say thank you, Lord. Please drink from the cup. The Holy Spirit wants to minister to bodies this morning. I want to invite you. Those of us, maybe you need this, maybe you don't, but there's a place where we can rededicate our bodies to the Lord. Maybe you've abused your body. Maybe you overworked it. Maybe you didn't feed it well. Maybe there's tension in your body and you need it to be rededicated. And Lord, Lord God, touch your body. But there's specific things that God wants to heal. We're going to ask you if you need your body restored for whatever reason, just come. You can be healed. I'd like to invite you to stand on your feet. All of you, stand on your feet. Rededicate your body and pray where you are standing. But if you need a fresh touch from God, a miracle even some, I'd like to invite you to come forward and our pastors and our elders, some of our deacons may be here to just lay hands on you and just pray with you before I call out specific things. If you need a fresh touch from God in your body, I'd like to invite you to come forward. Some of us need healing from, from insomnia. Just keep coming. No shame here. No guilt. God is removing shame. God is removing guilt. We've just had communion. God is saying, my mercies are here. Some things have been in, in disarray, disorder. I sense some that bodies have not been able to rest well. Even if you sleep, it's just not been restful. But God is touching brains, brain cells, and neural patterns. I'd like to invite some of our deacons and our pastors. Would you lay hands? Some of you, it's just in your mind. There's, the, the, you can't even sleep well because there's things hunting you in your memories. We're going to pray for you as well, but some of you might need more than that after this day. But if you're here, you need your physical body to, to experience a touch from God. There's so much people. I sense people that have had eating disorders, anorexic, bulimic. God is wanting you to be restored. I sense somebody, as several individuals, you need weight loss right now. You need weight loss. The body has been damaged by sin against you. And, 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 just, uh, and some of you, it's not just weight loss. Some of you, it's weight gain. Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you do thus that right now? In the name of Jesus, Lord, would you restore normal bodily functions? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, uh, I just sense more bodies just being touched right now. Some of you, it's skin disease. It's something that you felt like there's shame. You don't, want, you don't want to dress in a certain way. You've not had the freedom. In the name of Jesus, Lord, even as we're laying hands, Lord, by faith, Lord God, you're reaching out for those that are on the screen, on TV, on the monitor, online. Father God, we thank you, God, for you reaching out your mighty hand. Your arm is never too short to save. Lord, your arm is never too short to save. Would you heal bodies right now, Lord, even as we're laying hands on individuals all across this room. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I see souls that are crying out, what about me, Lord? What about me? That the very people that were supposed to protect me when I was a child, they were the very ones that hurt me. You don't need to raise your hands for this, but God wants to tell you, my daughter, my son, that was not for you. And I'm sorry. God is saying, let me heal you. Would you give me your heart? Would you give me your body? Would you give me those memories right now that you're remembering? It's triggering, it's triggering. But God is saying, let me enter that moment. Let me enter that painful moment. For Jesus is strong and Jesus is not bound by time. He is right there with you. He's wanting to touch you. He's showing something painful in your mind, in your dream, in your past, that you might know that God is covering by the power of His blood. He's saying, you're free. That shame is gone, the Lord's saying. The Lord is saying, be healed. Be healed. Father, all across this room, if you're a parent, you need to get your children, please do. We're over time. But we just want for you to just receive ministry right here. If you're right in this moment, don't miss it. God is moving right here, right now. I sense the old being removed. Some of you have been a Christian for quite a while, but this has not been removed from you. 
old addictions, old sex patterns, sexual sin patterns. Lord, broken, broken, broken now in the name of Jesus. Filthy spirits are fleeing. Evil spirits are fleeing right now. You have no right over this child. This child is covered. This child is covered. This child belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the darkness. Whatever sorcery and witchcraft has been used against them, Lord, we break it now. For the blood of Jesus cleanses from all defilement. All defilement. In the name of Jesus. Just take a moment. Just take a moment. Take a deep breath. Lord, you give love to those. You give sleep to those you love. Those that have not been able to sleep. Insomnia. Broken now, Lord. Some of them will see even just changes in their blood work, changes in their medical checkups. Lord, we pray. Those that are pending checkups right now. These appointments, Lord, visit now their bodies. Lord, I still speak instant weight loss. Some of you just need to check right now. Check your clothes. Check your belts. Instant weight loss. We call it forth. Those of you who have not gained weight in spite of your change of eating habits, Lord, I pray for weight gain. Lord, an appetite that has been lost. Father, right now, right here, heal what has been damaged. You are our restorer. You are our deliverer. Holy Spirit, we belong to you. For the rest of us, would you lift up your hands? while we're all receiving ministry. Lord, our body, see, our bodies are the temple of your spirit. Say, Father, I am an instrument of your righteousness. Use me. Father, in the name of Jesus, every cell, every tissue, every organ, in the name of Jesus, I speak order and power, power, eyes that have been malfunctioning, Father, in, in the name of Jesus, bring clarity now in Jesus' name. Those that have lost sense of taste and smell, Father, restore orderly nerve patterns. Orderly nerve patterns. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.